Yeah, right. it's, um, it's not a huge number today. I don't know what's going on. So it's going to be everybody else's loss. Um, it's a pleasure to have uh, Hill Aharoni uh, from the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel uh, speak to us this morning or this afternoon. Actually, it's even the afternoon here, the evening where you are. Um, Hillel received all of his degrees from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Israel, uh, which I alerted one of our colleagues uh, did the same thing, Yidit Sahavi, uh, but she actually is teaching now. She's a, uh, in the astrophysics area and she's teaching now otherwise she would have joined us. Uh, anyway, um, Hillel was advised by uh, Aran Sharon and Raz Kuperman. He finished his PhD in 2016 and then hightailed it over to Philadelphia to work with our friend Randy Kamian. Uh, and Xu Yang, I don't know Eleni Katapori, um, uh, but also at Penn. Uh, Hillel was recognized by the International Liquid Crystal Society with the Early Career Michi Nakata Award in 2018, and he joined the faculty at Weizmann in 2019, where he is an assistant professor. I also should point out that um, Hillel and I, uh, I was going to be visiting Hillel this December, January uh, for about a month, um, but uh, COVID had other ideas. And so that I don't think is going to happen. But in any event, uh, Hill, why don't you take it away and uh, look forward to your talk. All right, thank you very much uh, for inviting me, Chuck, and thank you uh, for coming. Um, I, I want you to take the advantage of, uh, you know, having a small, relatively small audience and stop me with questions, feel comfortable to, to do that. Um, and uh, my talk today, okay, so I'm not sharing my screen yet. Let me do that. Uh, share. Now see my screen? You do? Yes. Yeah? Okay, good. So my talk is going to be about uh, universal inverse design of uh, 2D pneumatic elastomers. And of course, I'm going to tell you in a bit what all of those words mean for, for those of you who are not familiar with the uh, terminology. And, uh, but, but let me uh, uh, forget all, all, the, all the big words and, and what I'm actually this work is about is I'm going to tell you how to uh, program any shape that you want into a flat, thin piece of rubber such that when you take your piece of rubber and put it in the oven or uh, turn on the light, it will adopt the shape that you have programmed into. Uh, and I want to convince you that you, you can uh, do it using pneumatic elastomers and you can do it uh, uh, in order, and you can program any shape into pneumatic elastomer this way, of course, under some constraints, but uh, to, to a high level of generality. Um, now this, uh, uh, this whole idea is part of, uh, wait a second, it is part of, um, uh, let's say, programmable design ideas that, you know, started uh, emerging in the, in the last uh, couple of decades, I would say. Um, even more, depends on how, how you count. Um, and uh, basically, uh, let, let me just give you a couple of examples, which are you know, not, not about the, the topic of the talk, but about the general scheme. So for example, self-folding origami, uh, this is from uh, Ryan Hayward's lab in, in UMass Amherst. Uh, you have uh, a flat material that uh, where you have certain lines on this elastic piece of material that are programmed to fold upon actuation. And when they, uh, when they all do that, your, your flat square becomes a bird. <coughs> it's a bird, but it is an origami bird. Uh, similarly, uh, the, the right video is hydrogels, uh, hydrogel sheets. This is from Arancha Rancharon's lab, my, my, where I did my PhD, um, where you have a material that shrinks isotropically at every point by expelling water. And different parts of the material are programmed to shrink by different amounts 
uh, due to their chemical uh, um, uh, composition. Uh, so when the, the bath of water in which this uh, uh, sheet lies uh, heats up, it changes the geometry and becomes this curly saddle. And when the water is cooled down again, uh, the, the sheet goes back to being flat. Now, uh, it was shown that using this uh, uh, mechanism, you can create a wide variety of, of shapes and, and different designs. Uh, so <coughs> and, and that by programming into the material different shrinkage fields or different shrinkage patterns at, at different points. And, uh, and uh, it was suggested that this could be used as a mechanism for general design of, of uh, three-dimensional surfaces or objects. Um, now, this is, could be used as a design or manufacturing mechanism, but it is very different from what we know typically in our everyday life. So the traditional scheme of shaping uh, a solid object is to take a material, and this is how all the objects around you basically are manufactured. Take a material, let's say glass, put it inside of some machine. It could be a mold or press, a 3D printer, or, or whatever machine uh, you have, or you know, just a person assembling thing. And uh, then once you uh, hit the, the button or, or activate the machine, it uh, exerts forces on the, on the elements of materials and, and reshapes it into a different shape. And then you have the object uh, uh, that you wanted to make. Now in the example I showed you in the previous slide, this is not at all how it works. So in the examples I showed you, the material itself is the machine. I'm here uh, borrowing terminology from um, Kaushik Bhattacharya and Mark Warner. So the, the material is the machine. Basically, the, the upon actuation, the material elements themselves deform and exert forces on one another. And this is how the, the material uh, reshapes itself into a different form, only by uh, exerting forces on itself. Uh, so it's the local division of freedom in the material itself that couples the external stimulus. It could be uh, you know, changing the temperature or, or any kind of uh, environmental field, and uh, couple it to the mechanical deformation of the material. So you need a local degree of freedom that is coupled both to mechanical deformation and to some external stimulus. Now in this uh, uh, scheme where the material is the machine, we have to remember that a machine is not only hardware, a machine is also software, okay? So in your big machine that made this glass, there is a program somehow uh, on how to make a glass. Um, when all you have is the material, it's the, these, same local degrees of freedom in the material have to also uh, act as a storage device, basically, to uh, uh, save into which the, the target shape or, or the route to uh, be, the, the deformation path from the initial shape to the, to the target shape is uh, saved, it's stored. Um, and one can ask which shapes I can uh, store in such a storage device or, or program into such a material and which shapes I cannot. It's not guaranteed that you can make any shape that you want. Uh, and the, um, so, so basically this question of different materials and how the local degrees of freedom uh, uh, allow you to, to, uh, to uh, bring through this design mechanism uh, could be exemplified by the net makers problem. So basically, uh, it's a old and, and common problem in make, making maps. You take uh, uh, the surface of a sphere and uh, make a planar projection of it. It's well known for many, many years that in order to do that, you have to deform certain uh, uh, parts of the, of the spherical geometry. Um, and the question is what attribute, what, what properties you wish to conserve and which properties you allow control over. Um, so for example, many map makers uh, chose to uh, make conformal maps that preserve angles or basically preserve the, the proportions of, of small countries 
uh, even if the scale is wrong. Um, and uh, such conformal maps would map small circles on the, on the surface of the sphere to circles on the map. Now, the size of the circle might be different from place to place. However, they will still all be circles. Um, now, if you had, uh, uh, going back to the previous problem, if you have a material which is, let's say, hydrogen, where uh, the material can only shrink and, and shrink and, and expand isotropically at every point. However, you can control by how much it does so at every point. Um, then you can use this uh, uh, conformal map, the, the, let's say the Mercator projection that appears on the screen here, <coughs> and uh, tell and make a flat sheet of, you know, a flat height. Of the sheet. And, <laughs> hello. <laughs> and uh, and then if you can um, make each part here uh, shrink according to the size of the circle the, 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 that's at that point, then your flat map will become spherical, okay? Similarly, if you had a different material that can do different things, for example, it conserves volume like uh, uh, rubbers or elastomers, um, but you are able to control the eccentricity or the direction in which, in which it deforms, then you are able to take an equatorial map and uh, use, use uh, the, 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 the incompressible material to uh, make that deform into a sphere. So the question when we have a new material uh, is, or a material that we should discuss, what are the degrees of freedom that are available? Can they be accurately con controlled and to which uh, um, range of deformation that they, 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 can, uh, they, they can be controlled? And which geometries can then be encoded into them and, and have to. So we know, for example, that in the um, materials I showed you here, we can take a flat sheet and make it uh, go to, and make it become a sphere. But can we use the same materials to make a flat sheet that would become something else? It's not a sphere. So, uh, obviously, it's a less common problem in map making, making things that are not a sphere. So, um, okay, so the material I'm going to talk about today is nematic, a nematic elastomer. A nematic elastomer is basically a polymer network that has a liquid crystal component uh, uh, embedded within it. Uh, so uh, there, there are many ways to, to execute that experimentally. It doesn't really matter. Uh, the bottom line is that you have a solid elastic material that um, has certain directionality, average directionality at every small area of the molecule. And um, uh, typically when such a material, so, so this is you know, a solid material. Typically when such a material is heated, the liquid crystal component tends to lose some of the pneumatic order and therefore shrink along the director and expand in the perpendicular direction. Again, there are different realizations of this, but this is typically what happens. And such materials were, uh, so, so uh, the, the Degen, I guess, is the first to think of the idea in the late 60s, but starting early 90s, uh, people have been making such material and it was shown that uh, pneumatic elastomers can uh, uh, deform uh, or can shrink and, and expand by factors of three or four um, in length in response to, to a variety of external stimuli. It could be temperature, they could be coupled to other types of stimuli. Um, they can exert mechanical work. They deform very quickly, typically within uh, uh, tens of milliseconds, and, um, and they're very strong and robust. So basically, uh, these seem like very ideal uh, candidates to, to uh, execute these uh, programmable design ideas. However, my work is uh, theoretical and uh, basically it assumes very little of the actual specifics of the material. And therefore, what I'm going to say is applicable not only for pneumatic elastomers per se, but also for uh, many kinds of, of pneumatic elastomer-like material. Uh, so these could be natural or man-made. So for example, plant tissues um, uh, 
respond to dehydration by contracting, but they contract differently in the direction of the cells and in the perpendicular direction. Also individual plant cells uh, uh, in many cases, in many types of plants have within their cell walls uh, cellulose fibers that prevent shrinking in some direction. So again, when even the individual plant, sorry, the individual cell uh, dehydrates and shrinks, it would only, the cell wall will, would only shrink in certain directions. And so this is a mechanism that's used by plants to uh, create shape changes upon dehydration. This is how all seed pods uh, work basically. Uh, and, and all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, vine twinings and, and things like that. Uh, also, uh, let me give a couple of man-made examples. So 4D printing, so it was shown that you can 3D print with uh, environmentally responsive materials to make designs that change their shape upon actuation, or you can uh, take an elastic material and, and make uh, air tunnels within it so that when uh, it responds to changing the pressure by changing uh, its shape. And there are many other examples. So um, all of these are very different from nanotech elastomers. However, they, they share the same uh, essential properties and could be described by the theory that I'm going to show you. Now, in all of those materials, uh, what we basically have is um, a, an elastic solid that have certain special direction embedded into it at every point. And upon actuation, doesn't matter exactly which type of, uh, 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 how this actuation is carried out, the material would shrink by some factor, shrink or expand by some factor of lambda one along the director and shrink or expand by a factor of lambda two in the perpendicular direction. Okay, and this is basically all that I assume about the, the material. Okay, now, uh, so I explained to you what pneumatic elastomers are. I still have to explain to you why I'm focusing on 2D uh, or basically thin pneumatic elastomer sheet. Um, and to answer that, well, the answer is that it's both mathematically interesting and uh, that it's applicable. Okay, the, so we have those two uh, uh, answers. And I'm going to, uh, let me explain why. So uh, we can start by counting degrees of freedom. Let's say we have a two-dimensional, a, a thin pneumatic elastomer sheet where the director only sits within the plane. So we only have one local degree of freedom. That's the, the planar angle of the director field at every point. Okay, so that's one scalar field degree of freedom. Uh, in 3D, we would have 3D bulk of pneumatic elastomer, the director can point anyway in three directions. So we will have uh, two degrees of two scalar degrees of freedom. That's the angle in the, that's the direction in 3D space to which the, the director is pointing in every point. Um, now, this is the number of variables that we have, number of, of degrees of freedom. The number of equations that we have that we have to satisfy if we are trying to create an arbitrary geometry. So um, in, in two dimensions, every two dimensional geometry can be, um, can be fully described by a scalar, one scalar field, one scalar invariant, uh, which is the, let's say the richest, the richest scalar of the, the Gaussian curvature. Uh, so this is a way to characterize every two dimensional uh, um, geometry. Um, in three dimensions, however, there is more than one independent uh, component of the curvature tensor. And in order to create a, a three-dimensional, uh, a three-dimensional geometry basically has six local degrees of freedom um, in the geometry itself. So by being, uh, and, and this grows quite quickly, so no point in even talking about higher dimensions. So if we have only two degrees of freedom that we can control, Obviously, there is no way to encode any geometry. So if I want to ask the inverse problem, let's say I have an arbitrary three-dimensional geometry that I want to create with a pneumatic elastomer. So I want to start with a flat pneumatic elastomer that when I raise the temperature will adopt an arbitrary three-dimensional geometry. Um, and the answer is that there is no way of doing that. Okay. 
because we have more equations to satisfy than degrees of freedom to, to control. Uh, so you can't make a three-dimensional object that will deform into any three-dimensional geometry. However, uh, in 2D, we seem to have just enough. Of course, it doesn't mean that we can satisfy all the equations because they are nonlinear. So uh, having as many equations as variables doesn't mean that you can always solve that. So uh, basically, the topic of this talk will be to show you that I can make any geometry with a 2D magical isomer, any 2D geometry. Um, so I will show you that later. Um, and also, another issue is about okay, let's say so we're not able to make any three dimensional geometry, but we can make some of them. Okay, a very small amount of them, but we can make some three dimensional geometry. Now, let's say uh, we do make them. Can we actually see by eye the geometry that we've made? And the answer is also no, because our object has to be embedded in our more or less Euclidean three dimensional space. Uh, and therefore, if we created, you know, a, a patch of, uh, of the three-dimensional sphere, then if we still, the, the, this bulk of material is inside of our Euclidean three-dimensional space, uh, some parts of the material will be stretched, some will be compressed, and this material will not adopt the geometry that it's programmed to have, it will be stuck. So there is, the program is inside, but it has no way of executing. Uh, and in two dimensions, if we make a very thin Euclidean, a thin, thin flat sheet, um, and give it an arbitrary geometry, let's say it's smooth enough, then it will, if it's thin, it will just buckle out of the plane and make this curved geometry. So it, a, a, a general smooth two-dimensional geometry could be embedded in 3D space. So we will be able to see uh, what, we, what we got. Or, or what we, we program into the material. So we can, the, the bottom line is that in two dimensions, we can program any geometry or any shape into our uh, uh, thin mathematical assembly sheet. And also this program can execute and we will be able to actually see that uh, shape. Are there any questions until now? Everyone is very quiet and on mute, so I'm not. Uh... Um, actually, yeah, I had a couple of questions. Uh, yes. One I just put in the chat box, which is, um, do you want to compare the number of curvature components or the number of metric components to the so degrees number, of freedom? Yeah, so the, the number of metric components is uh, kind of misleading because, um, I will, will I I'll actually talk about, well, we'll talk about it in the context of 2D, but it's okay. misleading because I don't really care when I'm trying to make a certain shape, I don't really care which point goes where or what coordinate system I'm using. So the actual uh, um, components of the metric tensor, uh, they have meaning with respect to uh, a certain choice of coordinates. Uh, mm -hmm. Since I don't really care, again, which point goes where, um, it's actually, okay, if, if I want to make, let's say a plane that becomes a sphere, I just have to tell it if I, tell the, the entire plane uh, adopt a Gaussian curvature of positive one, then it will become a sphere. I don't really care which point or I, I don't have to control each and every component of the metric. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, that, that makes sense. Um, it's, it's a sort of a quick follow about, uh, I think maybe I misunderstood, but it sounded like you were saying you can get anything you encode. But I mean, if you encoded a, a, a curvature of minus one, you couldn't get that right embedded in E3. I, are you talking if I encode if I encode the, like the entire you're talking about the entire hyperbolic plane? Yeah. No, uh, for now I'm talking about uh, okay, yeah, I didn't uh, I, I'm talking about let's say something of you know finite size. Okay. So I, I want to imagine something that can act, actually be done in the lab. Okay. So I can okay. make let's say this can give it a hyperbolic. Um, uh, we'll give it a negative Gaussian curvature, a cur curvature of minus one. I'll actually give examples of that later. Mm -hmm. um, and it will become a saddle of constant Gaussian curvature negative one. Of course, mm -hmm. I cannot make it infinitely big, mm -hmm. but I can make it big, bigger. Okay. I um, okay. Uh, I, and and you, you the well. Again, I have to take it thin enough, but you can embed any 
finite size two dimensional path of the hyperbolic plane inside mm -hmm. of, of uh, three dimensional. Sure. Okay. Sure. So um, so now let, let's let's uh, uh, talk about the actual system that, that I have in mind. <clears throat> so consider an, a flat uh, pneumatic elastomer, so a flat uh, uh, piece part of the plane where the pneumatic director is some angle within the plane. Um, and they use the Cartesian coordinates of the plane, x and y, and the pneumatic director is some field theta of x and y, which is the angle of the director at every point with respect to the x axis. And now uh, this is a solid flat material. And now if I actuate it, then uh, this portion of the material will shrink along this direction, and this will shrink along this direction, and this will shrink along this direction. Every point will shrink al along to the local director field at that point. And when, uh, when it all happens, you get a new geometry, a new metric tensor, which you can write that write this. Um, so the metric tensor, I guess uh, uh, the, the person who asked the previous question obviously knows what, what the metric tensor is. If other people don't know, so it's just the way to measure uh, infinitesimal distances between uh, uh, near material elements. Uh, so the metric tensor will just be uh, distorted or, or extended by a factor of lambda one along the direction, by a factor of lambda two along the perpendicular direction. And we will have this form of the metric tensor in the xy coordinates. Uh, and one can then take this metric tensor and calculate for example, the intrinsic curvature or any other uh, intrinsic geometry attribute that you want. Um, and if you calculate the Gaussian curvature of this, then you can get an explicit, uh, 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 an explicit equation for the Gaussian curvature. Um, and you can see that generically, if lambda one is, if lambda one and lambda two are not the same, so of course, if lambda one is the same as lambda two, this is just constant expand or shrink of the entire material. But if lambda one and lambda two are different, so the material is indeed anisotropic. And if the director field is not constant, so it depends on first and second, it has first and second non-trivial derivative, then generically we will get non-zero or a non-trivial Gaussian curvature field. And this means for a flat sheet that it will buckle out of the plane and make this shape which have uh, parts which are sphere-like and parts which are satellite, and we want to satisfy the Gaussian curvature field that we've uh, imposed on it. And let me give a specific example of this so that you can you can see it by eye. Uh, and let's go back to the map making problem. Okay, so we are want to make a flat pneumatic elastomer sheet that would deform into a sphere, and we can start by uh, exploiting the, you know, the high symmetry of the sphere. So we start by writing down the metric tensor of the sphere in conformal coordinates. Again, it doesn't really matter where we start, but this is a mechanism that we can use. So we write the, the desired geometry of the, the, of the sphere uh, in conformal coordinates where the conformal factor only depends on one of the coordinates. So I call these uh, uh, coordinates phi and eta, and the, the conformal factor here, sorry, I'm pointing on the board, you can see it. The conformal factor only depends on phi. And now there is a, I can actually integrate analytically the equations I showed you before, and one can get explicitly the director field. So now I can take a ribbon, and they can have a director field on that ribbon that only depends on the width coordinate of the ribbon, x. And this part of the ribbon is programmed to deform into a sphere, into a, an object that has a, a constant positive Gaussian curvature of plus one. Um, can I just ask a question? Yes. Is the situation always unique? Uh, the mapping from the original, uh, I'm no. sorry, from the desired from the desired shape into the pattern that you've uh, your solution. No, no, it's it's generically, generically very non-unique. So for every geometry that we'll try to make, there are many planar director fields that that if I make such an elastomer, will deform into that geometry. 
So I can make two things that look different on the plane. They have different planar shapes or planar domains. But when I actuate both, it will adopt the exact same geometry and I will be able to map them exactly to one. Does so it's it, not only. It, does it work in the other direction as well? In other words, do you ever find that um, there are, uh, you, you start with an initial pattern and you wind up with um, two different possible shapes. In other words, there's not a single correct path to where you want to go. Well, yeah, of course. If I start with a specific director pattern, then it will deform in a very specific way. Um, so, 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 so that, that way. Kind of many to one situation. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, now, uh, so, so we solve this equation and they make this ribbon. And now uh, let me uh, show you. So now let's say I, I created this ribbon. Do you also see my picture in your Zoom? I guess so. So I take this ribbon I'm showing here uh, in the camera. So it's just a flat piece of paper. And just to demonstrate what will happen to it, let me start by folding it into a cylinder. This, of course, does not involve any deformation. You see, I can do it with a piece of paper. Uh, very easily. So I'm just putting my initial uh, ribbon in the shape of a cylinder to be able to better show you exactly what happens. Okay. And now imagine that I draw tiny circles on that uh, uh, flat ribbon. Okay. So I draw tiny circles. Now upon actuation, all of these circles are supposed to become ellipses. And they're all supposed to become the same ellipse. So all of them, all each tiny circle of radius one should become an ellipse of principal axis lambda one and lambda two. This is what the, the pneumatic elastomer does. However, uh, circles that are here around the equator, as you see here in the director field, are programmed to expand horizontally, to, to become uh, horizontal ellipses, where circles around the side of the ribbon uh, are programmed to become vertical ellipses. And oh, the light went out on me. Okay, and uh, and circles in between are supposed to, you know, uh, become diagonal ellipses if you wish. Everything according to the director that I put. And now, when all of this happens at the same time, okay, my circle becomes a sphere. My sorry, my my uh, my uh, when all the circles become ellipses, my cylinder or my flat ribbon becomes a sphere. Okay. So this is by this is showing you how controlling just the direction, the in-plane direction of the, the deformation can uh, bring flat geometry into being a spherical geometry. And, and this is the idea behind the entire thing. Okay. So this is okay, an analytical solution to the sphere, at least. As I said, it's not a, a very hard problem. Also, we can use the exact same formalism to solve for any surface of revolution. Okay, so if I want to make any kind of surface of revolution, could be uh, the sphere, it could be a constant negative Gaussian curvature or non-constant, you know, it could be a torus or something. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm assuming uh, um, trivial topology here. So when I'm saying a torus, I mean patch on the side of the torus. Um, so for each surface of revolution, I can calculate analytically the director field that will, uh, when I put such a on the ribbon, very similar to what we saw in the previous slide, I will get my desired surface of revolution. But the general problem here, okay, my, my talk, the title here says universal inverse design. So the question, can I take an arbitrary shape, which, or an arbitrary two-dimensional geometry, which has no uh, assumed uh, symmetries and whatever, and come up with a director field for a pneumatic elastomer that upon actuation will adopt this uh, uh, three dimensional view or so buckle and, and make my shape. Okay. And uh, let me start uh, by showing you a numerical approach to answering this question. Uh, then I will show you an analytical approach. I'll start with numerical approach. Um, so, the numerical approach, so imagine we're given any surface, an arbitrary surface. The surface is given to us as some triangulated mesh. Okay. 
And now we start with an arbitrary parameterization of the surface. Okay, this is, so here is our surface in three dimensions, and this is some coordinate parameterization of it. Okay, so consider these coordinates psi, psi and eight. Okay, so for every vertex here, there are 2D coordinates, and I just draw uh, my surface in, in the coordinate space. Now, if I now draw an array of small circles in coordinate space, they will deform uh, and, and show up on the, on, on the three-dimensional surface. And this small circle will show up as an ellipse. Some will be bigger, some will be smaller, some will be more eccentric or less eccentric. Um, but they're generically, you know, an array of ellipses on the surface. Now, what I want to do is to change my coordinate parameterization in such a way that will, uh, so, so that all of those tiny circles will become identical ellipses with uh, uh, principal axis lambda one and lambda two. So I start with this arbitrary parameterization and they can focus on the single triangle uh, in this triangle, it is triangulated, I guess, which is um, because it's a numerical thing, I cannot represent exactly. Um, and they can look at each triangle in coordinate space and, and the same triangle uh, on the surface. And, um, and they can take the, the linear transformation that takes a triangle from the plane to the surface. And they can do a singular value decomposition of that, uh, of that deformation. So I can ba basically, treat any linear transformation as a combination of rotation within the plane, then stretching by some um, values along the principal axis, and then rotating it in three-dimensional space to its position on the surface. And they can ask, okay, what are the, thing, the eigenvalues, okay, or, or the principal stretches of this, um, of this deformation for this specific triangle? And they, specifically, are they lambda one and lambda two? And the answer is, of course, no, because they started with a completely arbitrary parameterization. So I, I have no idea what the the what the principal stretches will be and whether they will be lambda one, lambda two. However, now there is a, a straightforward algorithm. Um, it's actually an adaptation from a computer graphics algorithm. To bring those values closer to lambda one and lambda two. So the answer is a priori no, but then as I make an iteration of the algorithm, uh, these eigenvalues, so I, I'm changing my coordinate parameterization. So now all the uh, plane triangles are different and they brought the, these principal values closer to lambda one and lambda two at every point. And now I can run iteration of this uh, algorithm again and again and again until it converges. Okay, until when the when the thing is converged, I could be stuck in some local minimum, but hopefully I converge to a situation where, where the eigenvalues of all triangle, all the individual triangle deformations are close to lambda one and lambda. And if this is indeed the case, then an array of circles uh, in coordinate space will map under that mapping to an array of identical ellipses uh, on the surface. So the, the principal axis will be lambda one and lambda two at every point, and only the direction of the ellipses will be. Uh, <coughs> is it clear that the algorithm would converge? I mean, uh, you're so saying in practice it does, but do we know for sure that such a, such a, such a triangulation can be found? So the, the, the algorithm will converge, it doesn't mean that it will converge to the correct thing. So it depends on the, the initial parameterization. And it also depends, I, I, I still haven't shown you that the, the problem is, even has a solution, uh, right. an exact solution. So um, it will converge, but it might converge, uh, it might converge to, to a situation where certain triangles in the middle uh, are, are not close to lambda one and lambda two. Only there, there is no way to make this better, okay? Without damaging the other triangles. So uh, it, now it, it is very easy to verify whether or not we have a correct solution. Mm -hmm. uh, but, 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 but we can't guarantee 
one. It is possible that if you don't give me this space, but you give me something different, I will, you know, I will try different initial parameterizations and they will all converge, but none of them will converge to, uh, to an actual approximate solution to the inverse problem. I will be able to know that it happened, but I, I, I can't at this point prove uh, uh, that, that, you know, that it must converge. Uh, and this might be crazy, but could you live with having different lambda one and lambda two by changing the degree of pneumatic order as well as the direction of the order parameter from place to place? Well, well uh, uh, actually, when I started, uh, the question is basically about what can and can be done in experiment. I'll show you an experimental realization uh, later on in the talk. Um, and it is correct with what you're saying that if you also have control over lambda one and lambda two, local control, and you can vary them across the sheet, then you have much more to play with and, and, and it will make the problem much easier to solve. Um, and uh, in some systems, you might have control over that. For example, in 3D printing, again, it's not actually, it's like a metamaterial, so at large, you can, for example, control things like that. Um, however, in the, it, it is much more um, accessible experimentally to, to have just constant lambda one and lambda two and only control the there. Um, can I ask a question about the numerics? Yes. Uh, so are you doing like a steepest descent type of thing to minimization procedure, uh, Newton's method, oh. like what sort of numerics? So I, I guess the details, uh, I can send you the details or, or you can find them in, in the paper uh, that is cited below. Um, but basically, well, it, it's again, it's an adaptation of an algorithm from uh, computer graphics and basically uh, it's, it's called the local global algorithm. So every such iteration that I told you is composed of two parts. There is a part where I break all the triangles into individual pieces and uh, deform them individually into the, into the closest triangle that would match. And then there is a global stage where everything is glued back together and they are, um, and I'm trying to make a coherent uh, 2D parameterization of this or, or attribute vertex coordinates uh, uh, to the vertices between triangles. But, and, and it's, it's, not, uh, it's not any kind of like gradient descent. So I'm not minimizing an energy functional per se, but such a step is guaranteed to lower a certain energy functional and therefore it will convert. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, now let me talk about an analytical approach to, to that problem. So uh, as you saw in the numerical scheme, I started with some arbitrary coordinate parameterization that in which it's easy for me to write the, the metrics that I want to get to. And I ended up with a different coordinate parameterization, which is what I'm looking for, hopefully. Um, so again, we have this, Psi and eta is the, is the name I will give to the coordinates in which the geometry that I'm trying to make is given. And I'm looking for different coordinates, x and y, in which the metric tensor is written like this, where theta of x and y is some arbitrary field, is some field, okay? So I need to find x and y and the director field theta of x and y, such that um, uh, uh, the, the, this, metric g bar of sine eta transformed to the coordinates x and y will look like this, okay? So this is what I'm looking for. And of course, generically, it's very hard to find analytically. I don't have a good way of, of uh, directly uh, coming up with this coordinate transformation. But basically the approach is based on the fact that we are looking actually for a coordinate transformation. Um, now, let's assume that they did solve the problem. So I do have X and Y and I do have some theta of X and Y that are at every point. Then I can, based upon this solution, draw integral lines of theta of X and Y. So 
lines, basically these blue lines, which are parallel to the director in every point, and also these uh, pink lines, which are perpendicular to the director of every point. So that's the integral lines of the perpendicular uh, to the director. And having those objects, I can of course pull them back with any mapping. Uh, so I can draw the same, I can pull back those uh, vector fields or, or those integral lines onto the coordinates I, um, onto the, the sine eta coordinates and everything. And now the trick here of the analytical approach is to introduce a third coordinate system. Not surprisingly, the third coordinate system will be just based on those integral lines. So I'm just going to use those, this grid of integral lines of the director and the perpendicular director um, as uh, my new coordinates unit, okay? So in the coordinates unit V, the director is also always pointing in the U direction. So it's kind of boring. Um, however, uh, this is, first of all, I need, so all of this is based on a solution which I don't have yet, okay? All of this is based on some state of X and Y, which I don't know. Uh, also, distances that you see in the, so distances that you see here in the coordinates X and Y are the actual distances in the material in the pre-actuated state, okay? However, distances that you see here in the UV coordinates, they, they don't represent anything real. So you see that some of these blue segments are actually really long and other ones are actually really short, okay? So when you see uh, some distance in the UV coordinates, it, it doesn't really represent an actual distance, uh, neither in the pre-actuated nor in the post-actuated, okay? Now I could write the metric tensor in the UV coordinates and it will have, exactly for that reason, it will have scale factors, alpha and beta. So alpha is the thing that relates distances in the UV coordinates to actual distances in the, in the geometry. Um, and beta does the same for the V coordinates. Now, since I started with, um, since my coordinate system is by construction orthogonal, I don't have the du dv term. I only have the du squared term, the dv squared term. Now, it seems like I only complicated the problem now, okay? Because all I had is a director field and now I have these two scale factors and, and you know, this whole new coordinate system. However, the nice thing about the UV coordinates or the director field coordinates is that the actuation is very simple to write in those coordinates because basically all the distances along the director change by a factor of lambda one, or the distances perpendicular to the director change by a factor of lambda two. So all I need to do in order to, uh, so if this represents the pre-actuated metric, the post-actuated metric will just have alpha multiplied by a constant factor of lambda one and beta multiplied by a constant factor of lambda two, okay? Now, what I'm going to show you next is that in these coordinates, I can, uh, I can solve basically the inverse problem. I can integrate the inverse problem in the UV coordinates. And then I can also map it to both the Xi eta coordinates and the XY coordinates. So solving the entire problem in the UV coordinates, which are still not known a priori because they don't have the rest of it. I know that they exist, but they don't know exactly what they are. But as I solve the problem in these abstract UV coordinates, I will be able to find the mapping between xi and eta, which is the input to my problem, and uh, x, y, which are the coordinates I'm looking for, and theta of x and y, which is the director field that I, can, I need to imprint uh, onto my uh, mapping class. Now, um, so a pneumatic director field, uh, I want to, to basically represent this problem in the, in the um, in the UV coordinates, and they will have to start by looking at the gradient of uh, the um, at the gradient of the pneumatic director. Now, the gradient of a pneumatic director can be broken into splay and bend. Maybe you've heard talks about uh, uh, liquid pneumatic liquid crystals before. At least some of you definitely have or gave talks. 
Uh, so in 3D, you also you have play and bend and twist, and you know possibly set of play, and depends on how you want to, to uh, describe your material. But in 2D, all you have is play and bend. So the bend of a pneumatic director field is the amount by which it uh, changes as you move along the director. And the splay of a director field is the amount by which it changes as you move in the perpendicular, as you move tangently to the, to the director. Um, now, the same splay and bend also give us uh, a measure of how the scale factor, scale factors, alpha and beta change. Uh, again, you can, you can look at the drawing, it will make it clear. The bend of the director field tells us by how much the, the uh, alpha scale factor change uh, as they move perpendicular to the director field. And the splay tells us by how much beta changes as they move parallel to the director. So this bend and splay tells us how the director changes, but it also tells in certain directions, but they also tell us how alpha and beta change in certain directions. Now, the, so if I had the splay and bend, okay, of the director field, then I could, you know, solve for alpha and beta. I could just integrate the problem for alpha and beta. But I don't have, of course, a splay and bend because I don't have the director field. This is a part of the problem. What I do have is a compatibility condition on the splay and the bend. So if I know the cinematic director field is sitting on a, uh, a surface of a certain Gaussian curvature or on the manifold with a given Gaussian curvature, then it has to satisfy this compatibility condition. Okay. So this you can think of as a version of the Gauss Bonnet theory. It basically tells us that when you uh, make a small loop. Uh, so consider walking, let's say, a step along the director, turning by 90 degrees, taking a step in the perpendicular direction, and doing the same and coming back to where you started. And the amount by which you rotated has to do with the amount of Gaussian curvature that you surrounded. This is the Gauss Bonnet theorem. And this gives us a relation between the rate of change in the splay and the rate of change in the bend. Now, this still equation, this compatibility equation doesn't tell us how we can evolve the splay or the bend. It just gives us some linear combination of the two. However, we need to remember that we have two geometries, okay? We have the pre-actuated geometry. So the, the, we know that alpha and beta uh, as is represent something that is planar. Something that is planar in the, um, and uh, has zero Gaussian curvature everywhere. And we also know that as the material is actuated, alpha changes by a factor of lambda one, beta changes by a factor of lambda two. And the and this is, uh, I, you, you can calculate, of course, how the splay and the bend change as well. And you get also this equation for your post-actuated geometry, which we know. Okay, so we know the, the geometry that we are trying to achieve. So we have two equations, okay? And they also break up linearly in a nice way so that they can actually you know, add them, subtract them and get separate equations for the evolution of the splay along U and the evolution of the bend along V, okay? So what do I have now in the UV coordinates? We have a, a set of equations which tells us how the splay changes along U how the band changes along V, how alpha changes along V, how beta changes along U. And this is basically all of the variables that we have. So what we have here is actually a hyperbolic set of equations. Okay, hyperbolic uh, set of PDEs. Uh, so the characteristic uh, curves of this hyperbolic problem are the U and V integral curves. And we have half the information uh, S and beta propagate along the U lines and have the information B and alpha propagate along V lines and solving for all of those variables, S, B, beta, and alpha, we can solve everything. We can integrate X, Y, and psi eta and theta as a function of X and Y, the director field, which is actually what we're looking for, okay? So what we have here is just a well-posed hyperbolic problem uh, in the UV coordinates. 
Now, when we have hyperbolic problem, we know that hyperbolic uh, PDEs do have a solution around an initial condition. They can pose an initial condition problem. So for example, a Cauchy problem. So I can take, take a curve on my target geometry and I can decide, okay, I want the director field on this curve to be something. I want the, the um, I want the perpendicular derivative of this director field uh, uh, to be something, whatever I want. I just have to make sure that I, I, it's nowhere parallel to a characteristic curve. And then I can integrate a Cauchy problem. So I can start, I can basically solve for a director field on some portion of, of, my, uh, of my target geometry that sits around the initial curve. I can also, uh, the, the, well, I, I don't, let me not expand on it. There are other initial condition problems that one can solve. But basically, this guarantees um, a, an exact solution to any two dimensional geometry that they want to make, not necessarily globally, but at least within some uh, finite environment, finite uh, um, environment of some initial condition. Okay. Well, uh, let me mention this other initial condition. I can choose any curve on my uh, on my shape on geometry that I'm trying to make. I, I can actually have two any two curves that I want that are orthogonal at the point, and say, okay, I want this curve to be an integral line of the director. I want this curve to be the integral line perpendicular of the director, and then I can uh, start integrating the solution away from the that. Uh, away from the intersection. Okay. So this is basically shows us that locally uh, there is a solution to the inverse problem. Okay. And, and this also gives us an algorithm of how to obtain this local solution. Now, since I have freedom in choosing my initial condition, I get, uh, and this goes back to your previous uh, uh, question, Chuck. Uh, this gives me an abundance of local solutions. So there are many, many local solutions to the inverse problem. So let's say, okay, if I start at the nose here, okay, at the tip of the nose, there are many solutions, there are many director fields that I can make that will give me the exact same uh, portion of this node. Of course, not all of them I could integrate to make the entire face. Some of them I, I might be able to do that with some I might not. Okay, now uh, let me quickly show you an experimental realization of all of this so that none of this just stays like in the air. Um, so uh, this experimental realization was done by my colleague Chu Yang in uh, the University of Pennsylvania and her then postdoc Yu Xia. So basically uh, they take a glass uh, slide or, or glass transparency and then they coat it with some uh, polymer and they use a, a laser beam to make a micron sized tunnel within this, um, within this uh, uh, coating. And uh, eventually they take two such glass plates and they put a, a bunch of liquid crystal molecules and monomers in the gap between those two slides. Um, the liquid crystal molecules align along the channels. And once everything is inside and, and all of the liquid crystals are aligned with the channels, now of, of course they make a non, some non-trivial channel pattern that they give them. Then after everything is in place, they just turn on UV light and cross-link everything and the whole thing becomes solid and then they take it out of the glass. And then they have a liquid crystal elastomer sheet that has the channel pattern uh, 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 embedded into it as the pneumatic director at every point. Okay, so basically I, the, the procedure is, I start with uh, some two dimensional geometry that I want to make. I solve in either way, numerically, analytically, the director field that will uh, deform into such a geometry. I design a, a channel pattern and I give it to my colleagues. They, uh, make such a pneumatic elastomer, and then they give it back to me. Once they take it out of the mold, it, it just looks like a square uh, piece, a flat square piece of rubber, okay? 
Now, if you just look at it, it's a flat, thin square made of rubber. If you look at it through uh, cross polarizers, you see that at every point there is some directionality and there is some non trivial direction, direction pattern in it. Okay? So we see that some uh, areas are dark and some are bright between cross polarizers. It shows you the pneumatic director at every point. Now, this, if you of course look at it with your naked eye, just looks like uh, you know a flat square of rubber. If you put it, this uh, uh, item on the hot plate, however, it becomes a saddle. So it is programmed to become a saddle. Now this is the video. Let me run the video. It dances a little bit because the hot plate is hotter than away from the hot plate, so uh, it's not a perfect saddle. As you pick it up from the hot plate. This is video in real time, it's flat. As you put it back on the hot plate, it goes back into being a saddle. And again, if this was constant temperature, then it would just take the saddle shape and stay there. You can do the same for, uh, for a spherical shape or for you know, any other shape that you want. Uh, in the rightmost video, this is something that warms up slowly rather than uh, real time. And uh, so, so Again, this is how we can uh, uh, make an experiment in many shapes. Still, um, uh, it's kind of, it was kind of complicated to make more complex shapes, such as the face. And the reason for that, well, there are multiple reasons for that, but uh, the way to overcome many of those problems is to also induce extrinsic curvature, okay? So I told you that we make a channel pattern on the top and on the bottom. And there is some pneumatic director uh, uh, between them. We can also make the top and the bottom slide a bit different. Okay, so there will be some twist between the top and the bottom. Now I will not go into the details because we we don't. Well, I don't my time is I guess uh, close to being over. Um, uh, but basically, by using uh, this and second degree of freedom of controlling the difference in angles between the top and the bottom, we can induce extremely curvature. Okay, so extremely curvature means that not only do we tell a point what it's gauge, whether it should be uh, a saddle or a sphere, we also tell it which in which direction it should be a saddle and by how much it should be a saddle. Okay, now again we only have I, I don't want to I, I don't have time to go into the data. We, we can't control the entire extremely curvature tensor. We only have one degree of freedom, which is different in angle between the top and the bottom. So we cannot, um, so we cannot create any extreme curvature that we want. But we can make, we can calculate the 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 optimal twist field that we should induce. So basically, the optimal uh, uh, difference in angles between the top and the bottom we have to induce at every point to best match our target shape. Now this um, will distinguish between the, the target shape that we're trying to make and its isometry. So it will, um, it will be easy. This gives us a way to, when we're making a face, to tell you know, the nose to buckle outwards and the eyes to buckle inwards rather than all the other possibilities, which would be very, which would be very similar geometrically, um, however, very different in shape, okay? So this extra degree of freedom now allows us to uh, basically make a flat director field that would fold into the shape of a, a face or, or other shape that you want to make. Of course, um, this doesn't, uh, okay, the procedure is not exactly perfect. Also, there is a question of how to cut the boundary. In this video, it was cut manually, so you can see a lot of distortions around the boundary. Uh, but basically, this is the... <coughs> now, um, um, the analytical solution to we, as, as I said, going back to Chuck's question, this uh, method of, of um, integrating a solution away from, from an initial condition allows us to explore all directional fields that will involve, uh, th that will fold into a certain two dimensional geometry or that will buckle into a certain two dimensional geometry. And uh, again, so a given geometry, let's say we want to make a sphere, there are many directional fields. So basically all of those pictures below are directional fields that would uh, buckle in to make a sphere, okay? 
And now there are, you can use that uh, ID to optimize uh, uh, on them with respect to, to some other function that you might want to achieve. So uh, uh, if you, if application is, is uh, for, if we think about different applications of this, then we can, of course, change the initial condition in order to find, you know, first of all, a, a solution, a global solution to the inverse problem, also to try and minimize residual stresses with respect to, to the external, external bending energy, and, um, and also to control maybe the, the path of shapes from flat to curved and so on. Um, so, okay, with this, I, I would like to end. I want to thank people that worked on this with me in different, uh, uh, different parts of this project. Um, and uh, thank you for listening. I will be happy to take any questions. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, so I have a question, but I want to let other people jump in first. So people feel free to turn on your uh, sound. Let me stop sharing and show you my face. All right. Okay, it was interesting. I was watching the numbers go up and down during the talk. Um, we had a high of 17 at one point. Um, okay, so uh, one thing I noticed is that, unless I missed it along the way, that what happens if uh, the director becomes ill-defined at a point or a line um, in your plane. That kind of, I mean, ba basically, if you have a topological defect, you didn't seem yes. to. So, so the, the basic assumption here underlying all of this, okay, is that this deformation is, uh, <coughs> is just constant by you no know, factors of lambda one. And lambda. Of course, this will not be the case near a topological defect. Actually, I don't have, I don't even have to go to the, to the, to the uh, core of the defect itself. Even outside the, of the core, if the gradients in the director field are too strong, then, um, then there will be some compromise, okay? I, I kind of assumed that, uh, that the, the, that the, we are always at the, at the equilibrium between what the, the elastic component wants to do, what the polymer network wants to do, and what the liquid crystalline component wants to do. Of course, in the region where these are very incompatible, uh, we might have deviation. So close to a topological defect or, or basically to a region of high gradients in general, uh, I will not have lambda one and lambda two. The material will, uh, the, the local, uh, uh, minimizer of the of the of the of the balance <coughs> the uh, liquid crystal component and the and the polymer component will not be at this lambda one and lambda two, which is the values for regions which are not uh, very much deformed. Um, also, of course, near topological defect, the pneumatic order itself uh, uh, goes to zero, right? So obviously. Uh, right next to, to the it defect, becomes, where it becomes not it becomes not well defined. I'm not sure it actually. Yeah, does. yeah, yeah. Well, well I, I, so it, the the right is the scalar uh, the scalar uh, <coughs> the order will go to zero. Okay. The um, so, so so right obviously this material will not shrink by the same factor as we're going to, towards a different point. Um, but, but again, you know, one can think of, um, you know, if I have such a different one can, can say, okay, I can still look at large enough scales. There is, if, if I have a good scale separation, okay. So uh, uh, if I, 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 can, I can basically scale these solutions up and make just a bigger sheet of pneumatic elastomer and then they can, you know, punch the vicinity of the pneumatic elastomer, or the, the, the vicinity of the topological defect away. And then we'll just have a hole in the sheet. And I don't, I don't really care about what happens in the vicinity of the defect itself. I will have the correct geometry everywhere. Uh, but, but it is true that the, the, 
even my 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 local model near a topological defect is already wrong. I have more questions, but um, Harsh. Well, I, I had one more question. If I might ask one more. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so that was a very beautiful talk and a very nice proof that you can locally uh, create any metric. Um, is, is there a follow up to that proof that there's something like singularity theorems here that this local metric will eventually fail, uh, and you know, there's some distance out to which. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so in the same paper, so so this paper uh, we published it last year. So me and the um, then student not my students, but a student here in the Weizmann Institute, uh, I Gminyaski, and together with F.A. Frati as well. Um, so in this paper, we, we give estimates to how far away we can get from the initial condition before, the, before it fails, before we reach the horizon and, and uh, everything mm -hmm. collapses. Um, uh, now, you know, it's, it's initial, it's very coarse estimate, let, let's put it this way. Uh, and and it, it, it is a topic of, uh, of uh, research to try and extend this. Also, uh, you know, we have ideas about how you can artificially postpone the, that horizon by introducing uh, uh, lines of discontinuity and things like that. Uh, but, but, but basically, we don't have an exact answer to that, but we do have an estimate for how far away from the horizon is. But again, you, tweaking the value of your initial condition uh, might send this further away and allow you to come up with a global. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Hi, hi, hello. I have a, a quick question. Maybe I missed uh, some point uh, yeah. during your talk. Um, so uh, to solve your inverse problem, it seems to me that you're based on uh, a flash sheet uh, geometry. So is this method, uh, your method is, is also applic applicable to you know, any other you know, geometries? Yeah, yeah, you could. So, so, so again, many of the equations kind of rely on having an initially flat thing, but, but generally this scheme is applicable generically and, and the, the the mathematical results are too generic. So you could start with something non-flat, okay? You could start with a sphere and, and uh, have that sphere deform into, you know, any, in, into a face or into a whatever, a duck, okay? I see. So you, couldn't ha you could have any two-dimensional geometry deform to any other two-dimensional geometry. Again, there, there are for some assumptions, by the way. I do, um, um, again, this relates, the, the global problem has assumptions. So, so it does, since we do hit some finite horizon, if we have strong curvatures involved, this will bring our horizon closer. So, so we kind of need, um, uh, so, so globally, I cannot, of course, tell you the answer, but locally, yes, you can deform any small patch of the, oh, I'm not sure why my light is going off. <laughs> Yes, it's night here, so the lights in the building are set to automatically go off unless they move more. Um, so, uh, so yeah, the, the, you could go from any geometry to any geometry. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, showing my experimental bent. Um, so is there some sort of characteristic length scale below which a practical pneumatic cannot undergo curvature uh, related to say the material parameters. So for instance, uh, you know, like uh, if you deal with a surface tension ratio of an elastic constant to a surface tension should give you some sort of length scale. So yeah, yeah. Uh, what would that correspond to? <laughs> yeah, so apart from what I already said, uh, there is an assumption that we can imprint any directional field that we want into the pneumatic elastomer, but this is of course not real. I mean, we can make, you know, channel, uh, uh, the, the change the direction very quickly, and, uh, and, but we only have finite surface anchoring. <coughs> and um, and, and the, the pneumatic director will just not obey, okay? Because it's, 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 uh, it's weak anchoring. So, uh, the pneumatic director will 
So if we try to impose too strong gradients in order to produce strong curvatures, the pneumatic director, um, the pneumatic director will just uh, not obey and we will not have the, the actual director we want. Uh, so there is of course a length scale between the, the elastic constants of the pneumatic and the surface anchoring. So this is the, the length scale below which we cannot uh, uh, impose the pneumatic director. Switching. Now, okay. Um, okay. Uh, I can always talk with you. Um, Bob Brown has a couple of quickies. Yeah, it's actually a very nice talk. I just want to ask you, um, in a I think in many to one or one to many uh, issue, does your a final map go back uniquely to the to the uh, question to to the input? And if so, uh, could you could you be really um, really nicely processing <coughs> face prints instead of you know fingerprints uh, as identification of people? Wait, I'm sorry, I, I didn't understand the first question. Can you can you ask again the first question? So you have a final map. You have a final flat sheet, so yeah. I say. Does that uniquely go back to your answer? It's, think yeah. about think yeah. about Google Translate going back and forth and how much information is lost. All right. Yeah. My, my so the, the final solution that we have will will deform in a very specific way. Okay. So it, it will be just a, a physical object, and you know at least well everything is assumed to be you know with, with the small fluctuations or whatever. But but all of these objects are micros, macroscopic, so it's fine. Okay, the, the, let's say the, those, those objects that I showed you experimentally in the last couple of slides, um, every time you put them on a hot, you heat them to a certain temperature, they will deform in exactly the same way. Every time you cool them back down to room temperature, they will go back to being flat. Uh, so imprinting a certain directory will always give you the exact same deformation uh, uh, depending on the external stimulus. Um, now, uh, so the second question was... So uh, what about a commercial product here? <laughs> uh, so uh, I, at the moment, you know, I don't know, we, we yeah, we could in, in Principle: uh, Start a company where, right, where you send us a, a three-dimensional scan of your face, and then we have, uh, you know, we we ship to you by inside an envelope some uh, uh, rubber sheet, and then you can take it out of the envelope and and put it in the in the oven, and it will uh, give you the shape of your face. But this is, I guess, in order for this to work, as I said, it there. Are, many, uh, let's say, um, small problems to solve, both experimentally and, and also, uh, uh, you know, um, again, so, so in order for this to actually work, we have to, to do it infinitely thin, but the, and if it's not infinitely thin, there are also already residual stresses from the bending, so we need to overcome those, and so it's more of a problem than it sounds. But uh, no, I, I know we're, we're not working on a, on a commercial product at the moment. And, and uh, could you slice up a three-dimensional object and start working towards it? So, as I said, I'm not sure what you mean by slice up. Um, Make a two-dimensional slice. Yeah. So, so if I I could for any slice, okay, design a two-dimensional geometry, but those this combination of two-dimensional geometry is very far from giving us a generic three-dimensional geometry. It's, it's only a very small subclass of three-dimensional geometry. And, um, um, and also, of course, the, when generically, when making a bulk, okay, you cannot make it do very interesting things because whatever it will do, it will have to be uh, embedded in space. So it will always be some like residually stressed and, and then just slightly change its shape and, and then remain stuck like this. There is not, there is really not much you can do with the three-dimensional uh, bulk. Well, thank you very much. By, by the way, is that a Pac-Man behind you eating up part of your...
Uh, I don't. Is there a Pac-Man behind you? Uh, which which one appears to be like? Oh, never mind. <laughs> yeah, one of them. Yeah, possibly some of them look like Pac-Man. Like <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Anything else? More questions? Okay, Hill, thanks so much for staying up late. Uh, you're welcome. You're, it's not that late. It's just, uh, yeah, if I hurry home, I can, uh, I can uh, put the kids to bed. <laughs> All right. Very good. Thanks so much. And uh, I'll be in touch also regarding the December, January thing. <laughs> All right. Okay. okay, very good. Thank, Thank you. you.